Okay, I think we'll uh, get started. I have been uh, installed, or I suppose reinstalled, as the moderator of this panel. Uh, my name is Ilya Soman. I'm a professor at George Mason Law School, uh, and this panel is actually uh, part of a symposium that I'm co-editing with the Supreme Court Economic Review, a journal that uh, we run and publish with the University of Chicago Press, and I'm very happy to be able to, along with the Federalist Society, sponsor this uh, panel and symposium on post kilo eminent domain reform. Uh, I think Kilo has drawn a bigger political reaction than virtually any Supreme Court decision at least of the last 35 years with both the federal government and over 40 states passing reform legislation uh, trying or at least claiming to try to uh, ban the kinds of economic development condemnations that Kilo permitted. Uh, so we have an excellent panel today. All of these uh, individuals will be contributing articles to a symposium in the Supreme Court Economic Review. Uh, in addition, we will have articles by Richard Epstein and uh, Andrew Morris, who unfortunately could not be here today for the panel, but look for their contributions in the symposium. Uh, so I think without further ado, uh, I'll introduce the panel. I can't possibly list all of their many wonderful qualifications, or at least it would take the entire time for her to do so, uh, but I'll just give you some idea of their eminence, and I'll shut up and turn the uh, floor over to them. Uh, so we're going to start first with Professor David Dana uh, of Northwestern University School of Law, uh, who has written extensively on property law and environmental law. Uh, and I've heard that actually in the process of writing a book uh, on these issues called Condemning the Poor. Uh, then we'll have my uh, George Mason University colleague, Steve Eagle, uh, who, as many of you know, has also written extensively on a variety of eminent domain issues, uh, has written some articles about Kilo, and has testified about Kilo before the United States Senate. Uh, third, We'll have Professor James Ely of Vanderbilt University, uh, who again has written extensively on property law, uh, has written what is perhaps the best known history of constitutional property rights uh, in the United States, the guardian of every other law, uh, which has come out in a fine third edition this year, uh, which I was happy to recently get in the mail. Uh, and he has written an article about Kilo in the Cato Supreme Court Review. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, an excellent up-and-coming scholar, uh, Daniel Kelly, uh, who this year is an Olin Fellow at Yale Law School uh, and has written uh, a very interesting article published uh, last year in the Cornell Law Review showing how uh, secret acquisitions of property may be an excellent alternative, and so at least in some circumstances, uh, to the use of eminent domain. Uh, each panelist will speak for about 12 minutes, uh, and after that time, we'll open up the floor to your questions. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'm going to turn over the floor to Professor David Dana. Um, thank you, Elliot. And um, well, I, I, I very much appreciate the invitation to be here. Um, uh, I took the topic a little broadly of post-Kilo reform, kind of uh, in a sense that I wanted to talk about one possible line of reform that hasn't been engaged in that much, but I think potentially uh, may make some normative uh, sense. Uh, and that mostly focuses on as, as a matter of state constitutional law. So in the post-Kilo period, um, there have been some important state constitutional decisions, like in Ohio. Um, uh, but most of the action really has been in the statutory domain, uh, and primarily at the state level, even though there's been some federal statutory developments. Um, and one of the things I was interested in exploring and thinking about whether it may ultimately be picked up by the courts is whether uh, there may be more room for state constitutional law innovation, even aside from uh, what, the, what the state legislatures do in the first uh, part. And in particular, um, I wanted to look at how the uh, kilo and the kilo phenomenon might be tied to things that had happened in state constitutional jurisprudence outside of this context. And so my starting point in the essay that I, I'm trying to write for this uh, symposium uh, really was exclusionary zoning jurisprudence. Um, which in some ways is kind of faded, uh, you know, it's kind of a 1970s <laughs> sort of thing. Um, um, so some of you may remember from the recesses of your mind uh, having to hear about Mont Laurel, uh, the Mont Laurel decisions in New Jersey. Uh, and, uh, but in, in actually many states, at least in th in, as a theoretical level, as a matter of state constitutional jurisprudence, there are some kind of general doctrinal notions that there are state constitutional limits on how much local zoning can be used to exclude uh, lower income or moderate income people. And uh, that raised in my mind the question of whether that same kind of theory 
um, might travel over to the context of eminent domain, whether there might be state constitutional limits or should there be state constitutional limits on ways in which eminent domain or the threat of eminent domain uh, can be used to exclude low or moderate income people from areas that are not, that are wealthier. Um, and this kind of came into sort of crystallization in my mind um, because I was doing a case study of, I keep, I always mispronounce it, Lodi, New Jersey, um, but basically trailer parks in New Jersey. Uh, there's a series of trailer park developments in New Jersey. Some of them, the way they're set up is kind of uh, interesting. Sometimes the individual, uh, I'm going to use all the wrong terminology, mobile home owner has some uh, fee property and sometimes they're really just tenants. But in any case, a number of New Jersey towns have tried to essentially get rid of them. Um, uh, sometimes in cooperation with the underlying owners or not. Uh, and for reasons you can understand. I mean, they don't generate that much revenue. They sort of take up tax burdens. Uh, New Jersey, like most states, largely relies on local property tax. Um, and these are kind of an area of substantial, aff relative affordable housing in an area that has very high housing costs. And it turns out that there's some ca category of cases that really look like almost the flip side of the Mount Laurel exclusionary zoning cases, where, you know, in exclusionary zoning cases, you have usually middle class, not rich suburbs, trying to keep out lower income people from sort of coming in by l constricting or limiting the construction of, say, multifamily housing, right, you know, apartment buildings. And in what I'm going to call exclusionary eminent domain context, you have suburban towns, usually, again, middle class towns, not what really rich towns, trying to get rid of, essentially, lower income housing uh, through the use of eminent domain or the threat of eminent domain. Um, and they both have effects on the composition of the housing stock. You know, they both increase concentrations of wealth. They both tend to disperse lower income people who may get concentrated elsewhere. And so some of the same concerns and arguments that might inform exclusionary zoning doctrine could be used in this context. And actually, in, in the New Jersey case, um, the uh, New Jersey Public Advocates Office, which I found out still exists, <laughs> um, which actually uh, brought them out, more or less, uh, brought them out Laurel cases, um, uh, did kind of make this argument in a sense in a brief in, in some of the litigation in, in Lodi, but it wasn't really picked up that some kind of exclusionary zoning flip could be used as a constitutional argument against eminent domain in certain contexts. Um, the other context where it seems to come up is in urban gentrification, a uh, kind of looking at Atlantic Yards or some of the other big projects um, uh, around the country. You have contexts where you have neighborhoods that are fast gentrifying or areas that are already substantially gentrified where some of the remaining uh, residents are lower income and eminent domain seems to be in a sense kind of pushing gentrification, creating more economic segregation. And the question there is whether some kind of analog to exclusionary zoning could also be used as a kind of state, again, it would really have to be a state constitutional law constraint on eminent domain. So the purpose of the essay or the paper is to kind of explore that idea. Um, would this be a good theory? Uh, would there be a kind of normative basis for it? What kind of uh, practical problems would there be? Um, I don't really um, make the argument that any court's going to pick it up, you know, any day. Although I suppose if any court were going to pick it up, uh, most likely it would be the New York or the New Jersey uh, court. Um, so uh, part of the argument is, is going through how would you structure an exclusionary eminent domain doctrine? Um, you know, would you look at fair share allocations? Would you set up rebuttable presumptions? And, and what would it do? I mean, the basic argument is it would do two things. One, if there's some kind of constitutional constraint about condemning lower income housing in wealthier towns, it'll tend to push condemnations or development away from replacing that housing. Um, that, you know, it, it'll raise the cost for the town, for, for developers uh, to focusing on those targets that are otherwise very attractive because typically politically and economically uh, they're more, they're, they're less trouble to, to get rid of. Uh, it also may just translate into more compensation for both absentee landlords and low income owners. Um, so it, uh, it will have, if, if this were adopted, this kind of constitutional constraint, it wouldn't necessarily end any development, um, but it might change patterns of development somewhat. Uh, and it might also result in more compensation uh, if you kind of try to model economically, at least in some cases. And so part of the paper, um, in deference to Ilya, I asked Ilya, you know, for the Supreme Court economic review, how much economics does it have to have? Um, so there's a little part of it that, that, <laughs> that purports to be economics um, that you can try to sort of figure out when would you get more compensation effects and when would you get more displacement effects. Um, a lot of the paper is really trying to argue about is this a good idea? I mean, is there a normative rationale for trying to have this constitutional doctrine. A and I think there are really two different rationales. One of them is pretty familiar to the debate that the people on this panel have talked about. One isn't. One has to do with subjective value of property. Um, 
you know, one critique of the just compensation formula that everyone's familiar with is it doesn't capture subjective value people have in their homes. Um, you know, you get fair market value, uh, fair market value before development that, you know, if you've been living somewhere a long time, um, you know, Mrs. Kilo was very attached to her house, clearly, right? It, you know, she had more value than the fair market value. Um, one of my arguments is that for lower income people living in middle class or wealthy towns, there's a lot of subjective value that, that's lost, that isn't captured, because not only do they lose their home, which has a subjective value, they really lose the option to live in that kind of community, because almost by definition, they can't afford to stay in the same area. Uh, and this is a rhetoric you often see in the eminent domain context where people say, look, it, you know, it isn't even necessarily so much that my little kind of rundown bungalow is so important to me, but I can't rebuy in the same area. Um, so I think the subjective value concerns are particularly salient when you have this difference between income levels between the condemned or to be condemned residents and the sort of overall housing stock in the area. And in that sense, you might get more under compensation under the current regime than now, and maybe this constitutional constraint will tend to push up that compensation. Um, the other argument, which is really pushing back from the older uh, kind of Mont Laurel tradition for why this might be a good idea has to do with the concentration of poverty literature. Um, and there's a very substantial, although you know, kind of disputed literature that says that poverty is not just bad, but poverty is worse when it's concentrated, right? That you know, the school systems get worse, social modeling gets worse, that, that there's some value in having people of different income levels together, particularly value uh, in terms of certain kinds of social problems. Uh, and if you have uh, condemnations that are easier to do of lower income neighborhoods or areas in wealthier towns, people go somewhere as a result, and the argument is that they will tend to go to other low-income areas if they're displaced, and that may increase these concentration of poverty effects, uh, these kind of disparities in, 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 in schooling, uh, that depending on how you view it, may actually have a social cost on their own. So it's really two separate rationales for this sort of constitutional um, doctrine. How am I doing on time? Are you the time? Uh, you still have about, about a minute or so. Okay. So anyway, there are lots and lots of objections to this. One is, will anyone ever do this? <laughs> Will any court ever buy into this? Um, one, you know, one objection is what should be courts to be doing this sort of thing at all? Um, the exclusionary zoning cases got a lot of critique because they're kind of an activist court uh, thing, and, and I think that's a real legitimate question. Um, I, I do think that if this theory were out there, it wouldn't actually be deployed that much because, of course, zone, exclu ever, all zoning is exclusionary. So if you say, well, we're going to police for exclusionary zoning, you're kind of having the courts take over the world. Um, but eminent domain is a relatively thinner practice, and so I think these kind of cases are fewer. Um, I also think that because this doctrine would be tied to state public use clauses, you could cabinet. I mean, one problem with the exclusionary zoning doctrine is it created heightened review, but it was unclear how you would ever limit it because it was based on really substantive due process notions that had no boundaries. This would really be tied into a kind of a public use tradition. Um, and I think that uh, one or another argument against it that I explore is whether towns just would be less willing to accept low or moderate income housing in the first place if they think it's harder for them to deploy eminent domain down the road. And I think that's a real argument. Um, the question is how strategic we really think local regulators are. Um, so anyway, this is an area of reform that is, um, I guess the purpose of this essay would be to kind of put it on the table maybe um, because it hasn't been central to the kind of kilo, uh, post kilo debate. I believe we're going in alphabetic order, so next is uh, Professor Steve Eagle. Uh, take it away, Steve. Uh, thank you, Elliot. Uh, my paper is on Kilo, Directed Growth, and Municipal Industrial Policy. And basically, what I'm trying to do is to examine not eminent domain onto itself, or abusive eminent domain as a narrow subject, but rather looking at eminent domain in the entire context of what I call directed growth and what I want to bring into the argument as industrial policy. By directed growth, I'm referring to both a combination of smart growth as we understand it, as telling people what kinds of areas to, to live in, but also the notion that government is going to use uh, fiscal as well as legislative policies and a whole array, array of tools to affirmatively entice and cause growth of special kinds 
to occur in special areas, i.e. the equivalent of the five-year plan or the 10-year plan. You know, the, the LSE uh, uh, hegemony in India may be passed, but certainly it isn't in the cities of the United States. And so I'm going to look at Kilo as it pertains to that, which, which uh, leads me to start with the story of uh, Dr. Bob Siskovic, who is a research scientist who was one of the team that originally invented Lipitor, which is the, has been the most successful drug in the United States in terms of, uh, of uh, revenues, and who was head of a major pharmaceutical laboratory. Anyway, the company he worked for closed his very large laboratory, put Dr. Sislik and about 2,000 colleagues out of work. And this laboratory was in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, the state of Michigan and the city of Ann Arbor, uh, for whom this lab was the uh, greatest uh, taxpayer, the University of Michigan, alas, not being on the tax rolls, uh, got together and developed a kitty of millions of dollars to try to entice new growth and to try to find some kind of work for the PhD uh, uh, chemists, including Dr. Sislik, who lost their jobs as a result of the closing. Well, the company that engaged in the closing fired about half the staff, but transferred the other half of the staff to its other major research facility, which it was, uh, uh, had built as a biologically based, a set of a chemically based pharmaceutical research facility. And this facility was in New London, Connecticut. And, well, you know the rest of the story. Uh, as uh, the uh, city of Ann Arbor and the state of Michigan are pouring millions of dollars in to try to find jobs for Dr. Sislik and the other people who were displaced as a result of the closing, millions of dollars was offered by the state of Connecticut and the city of New London to entice the company, uh, Pfizer, uh, to build its uh, world headquarters and to have nearby amenities in New London. So the winners and the losers are practicing what I would call industrial policy. S some successful in this round, some not. Perhaps ultimately it's a zero-sum game. Uh, certainly it was uh, a loss to some of the people in New London, not the least of which for our purposes was uh, Suzette Kilo. Uh, the tools that municipalities have available are a vast array. They include condemnation, but I think of condemnation as basically a last resort and an implicit threat more than the reality that, that mostly motivates what's, what's actually going on. Uh, traditional land use regulation, which is not traditional at all in the sense that the original Euclidean zoning which allowed narrowly defined land use, but as a matter of right, was replaced by all kinds of devices like cluster zoning and plan unit uh, uh, development and uh, plan communities, which enable a wide array of uses to be engaged in, but at the price of municipalities having discretion. And that municipal discretion, of course, led to impact fees, linkage fees, uh, fees, and the notion now is that private land is in play. Private land is available for local government to shape the destiny of the community, not as the traditional zoning would have it to protect the public health, safety, and welfare in general terms, but rather to custom tailor the kind of growth that the community wants. The community, of course, also would do this through direct subsidies and through implicit subsidies uh, like, ta like tax increment financing, which means that the tax revenues which otherwise would have inured to the city's uh, police, education, fire, and other divisions as a result of a project now get diverted into creating the project itself which is to say the project is basically tax-free as a subsidy, as a tax expenditure for the, uh, for the owners. Uh, 
You, uh, and then, of course, you have regulatory property, which is what I would call transferable development rights, which is where the city is giving or selling to A the right to develop B's land by, by giving A certain uh, credits that could be transferred to the other parcels. So all of these things are going on. And uh, uh, the Supreme Court has not done a better job resolving many of them than it has resolving the takings issue, which we're most familiar with. For instance, uh, the Supreme Court has been fairly good under the Dormant Commerce Clause in, in, uh, in trying to uh, prevent uh, state discrimination against out-of-state businesses, but yet uh, the court uh, certainly has not contested that uh, direct subsidies to the home team, to in-state competitors, have exactly the same economic effect, and the states ref and the Supreme Court uh, in the uh, Westland Creamery case in 1994 adamantly simply refused to take that question up. The, so the Supreme Court has left unresolved the whole question as to, to the extent to which local and state governments can use uh, the taxing power and the spending power as a way of reshaping land use. I have no doubt that as a result of the Kelo case, is going to be politically unpropitious and to a certain extent legislatively difficult to have the kinds of, of grabs from uh, small homeowners such as Mrs. Kilo and her neighbors to use for large industrial projects. I am not sanguine, however, about the extent to which that, that this is going to have a practical effect on preventing the kind of development we're, that I'm talking about, largely because a few years ago in a, uh, 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 David Osborne and Ted Grabler invented the marvelous phrase in the uh, uh, early 1990s that uh, government should steer and not row. Government should steer growth and private industry should do the heavy lifting of keeping the thing going. And that's what Pfizer is supposedly doing in, uh, in New London. I say supposedly because, uh, in fact, the project is having, still having immense financing difficulties and has just gotten another reprieve a few weeks ago. And uh, whether the, Pfizer pro whether the, the New London uh, project adjoining Pfizer ever will be built at all is something that uh, I think is still conjectural. So we have this overall notion then of where does takings fit in in, in the overall industrial policy scheme of things. Uh, the policing mechanism that the Supreme Court ultimately set up in Kelo makes very little sense to me. To put it in uh, Justice Kennedy's words in his concurrence, the, a court applying rational basis review under the public use clause should strike down a taking that by a clear showing is intended to favor a particular private party with only incidental or pretextual public benefits. And with due respect, I have no idea what that means. Take the 99 cent stores case, which is a case that Justice Stevens cited as a situation where the courts can police things. 99 cent stores was a uh, uh, small big box chain in California. Uh, uh, it had a store in Lancaster. The Costco stores, which is a much larger big box chain and which was the linchpin of industrial redevelopment in the city of Lancaster, told the city, we want the, Cos we want the 99 cent store parcel for ourselves. And so they trumped up a, a study they, uh, which was paid for by Costco. They discovered that there would be, quote, future light, unquote, on the uh, 99 cents parcel, and so th it was condemned for, uh, for, acqui it was, uh, for acquisition by Costco. The courts ultimate, ultimately stepped in. But while the Supreme Court thinks this is pretextual, I think it's perfectly fine under Kelo for the reason that ultimately the question in terms of pretext to me comes down to is the city acting in good faith to further municipal development in the city. 
In the 99 cent stores case, for instance, there was absolutely no showing that uh, the uh, Lancaster city officials were bribed or otherwise were deflected from their duty. They genuinely, and I think correctly, thought that Costco, with its $400,000 in direct local tax revenues, compared to 99 cent stores, $40,000, and Costco's potential as doing even more urban renewal and development projects was a far better bet. That doesn't, to me, differentiate the situation from any, uh, any of the condemnations of certain parcels in New London, leaving other parcels like the uh, Dramatic Club, which was the Democratic uh, headquarters and more upscale kinds of condominiums out of the condemnation simply because it was more practical to do it that way. In other words, if the touchstone is going to be pretext, the answer has to be if the city honestly thinks it's doing the best to redevelop the city and that's really why it's doing it. The notion of pretext uh, makes no sense the city and ra rather than the company is being benefited. So putting all these tools together then and looking at eminent domain within the wider project of industrial policy is the part of the uh, problem of Kilo and, the, and that I'm going to be working on and have started working on and I see Kilo as only a small part of the larger problem. Uh, well, next is uh, Professor Jim Ely of Vanderbilt University. Thank you, Ilya. Uh, I'm going to focus uh, essentially on the reaction, public, legislative, judicial, uh, to Kilo. Uh, I should note at the outset that our moderator has written extensively and very perceptively uh, on this topic, and although my conclusions have been informed by his work, I, I reached a slightly more optimistic uh, conclusion than I think Ilya ha has reached, um, that perhaps um, uh, signaled by my title, post-Kilo reform, is the glass half full or half empty. It's rare that a Supreme Court decision, especially one involving the rights of property owners, arouses the furor that greeted Kilo. Some scholars, as we know, purported to be surprised by the intense public reaction. After all, we were told, the justices were simply following precedent. Such a myopic assessment is, in my view, uh, sadly wide of the mark. Kilo represented a novel and expansive affirmation of eminent domain power. For the first time, the court put its seal of approval on the condemnation of residences for transfer to private developers for the purpose of promoting economic growth. Further, the factual circumstances of Kelo were very different from those earlier cases cited by the court. The Kelo majority relied on language plucked from context and disregarded cautionary words in prior decisions. What clearly hit the public nerve, however, was the fact that average homeowners understood that they could be adversely affected by the aggressive use of eminent domain power. The open-ended language of the court could render virtually every piece of property subject to an economic development taking, a point driven home by both Justices O'Connor and Thomas in their dissents. But there's no use crying over spilt milk. My thoughts about Kilo have been expressed elsewhere. The crucial inquiry now is whether the negative public reaction has produced any results that will meaningfully rein in the free reeling use of eminent domain power sustained by Kilo. Admittedly, the picture is incomplete and it's constantly shifting, but the conclusion at this point is, I think, decidedly mixed. As I see it, there is no realistic prospect for any move to curb economic development takings at the federal level. The Supreme Court is unlikely to revisit this issue for some years. Moreover, two of the dissenting justices in Kelo have left the bench, and it is uncertain how their replacements would vote in a future public use case. Federal appellate courts have treated Kelo as virtually foreclosing any room for a public use challenge. 
This was even true in a recent case in Port Chester, New York, in which the evidence suggested that eminent domain was being used for the purpose of financial extortion. Nor can one look to Congress for relief. True, the House of Representatives, uh, by a wide margin, passed a resolution in 2005 expressing its disapproval of Kelo. But talk is cheap. Proposals to bar federal funds to support the exercise of eminent domain for private economic development purposes have floundered and not, I think, proved effective. It is inconceivable that the present Congress, under Democratic Party control, will advance any measures to protect the rights of property owners. Nor has the Bush administration shown much sustained interest in the question. Consequently, for the foreseeable future, any serious attempt to check eminent domain abuse will take place at the state level. In marked contrast to the muted reaction at the federal level, there has been a good deal of activity in the states. This has taken the form of legislation, constitutional amendments, and decisions by state courts. It is not always easy to ascertain, however, whether this outpouring of legislation and judicial activity amount to meaningful restraints or hortatory fluff. By one estimate, 42 states have enacted new laws aimed at preventing kilo-type takings. Now, uh, unless the new math has changed this, that means that eight states, including such uh, jurisdictions as Massachusetts, New Jersey, and New York, have not enacted any laws restraining the use of eminent domain. Among the 42 jurisdictions that have passed such laws, the efficacy of these measures varies widely. Some appear to constitute genuine reform, while others afford virtually no additional protection for property owners. The most conspicuous problem with the Kelo reform laws is the exemption for blight condemnations. As a practical matter, vague and open-ended definitions of blight permit local authorities to take almost any property and thus undercut legislative restrictions on private economic development takings. It bears emphasis that definitions of blight have moved rather far from the slum clearance projects in the 1940s. Indeed, the Supreme Court of New Jersey, perhaps an unlikely source of uh, support for the rights of owners, the Supreme Court of New Jersey recently uh, cautioned that, and I quote them, under an all-encompassing definition of blight, most property in the state would be eligible for redevelopment. A crucial step, therefore, is to fashion legislative language that tightens the criteria by which property could be designated as blighted. Such determinations, moreover, should only be permitted on a parcel-by-parcel -parcel basis. Other problems with post-Kilo laws include definitions of public use that do little to halt economic development takings. Lawmakers, perhaps by design, have often created the appearance of reform but provided little substance. I'm afraid my adopted state of Tennessee falls into that, into that category. Yet, the legislative picture is not entirely bleak. A number of jurisdictions, Florida, Alabama, New Hampshire, have enacted laws, uh, often by wide margins at public referendum uh, or amendments to state constitutions that ban economic development takings and limit blight designations. Given the determined opposition to eminent domain reform by developers and local government planners, defenders of property rights have, I think, achieved some positive changes. Still, the legislative record stops far short of supporting offhand suggestions by Chief Justice John Roberts and Judge Richard Posner that the political process in the states is sufficient to protect individual property owners from eminent domain abuse. It also begs the question, which I think well warrants further scholarly exploration, of why the public use requirement, practically alone among the provisions of the Bill of Rights, is relegated to the political arena. Decisions by state Supreme Courts have been more promising. Even before Kelo, 
several state Supreme Courts had struck down exercises of eminent domain for economic development purposes by private parties. A milestone in this regard, of course, was the decision by the Michigan Supreme Court in overturning the highly controversial Poltown decision. This trend toward greater scrutiny of economic development takings by state courts continued following Kelo. As has already been mentioned, two state Supreme Courts, Ohio and Oklahoma, have specifically repudiated the reasoning in Kelo and construed their own state constitutions to afford greater protection against eminent domain. Other state courts, although less direct in rejecting Kelo, have also demonstrated renewed skepticism about the use of eminent domain for economic development purposes. A few examples must suffice. The Maryland Court of Appeals invalidated a quick take condemnation because the city failed to demonstrate the need for immediate possession of the land at issue. The court ruled that mere assertions about urban renewal were not sufficient to justify the abridgment of a property owner's rights to procedural due process by the use of the extreme power of quick take condemnation. For, moreover, and I think even more, potentially more significant, the court maintained that in the last analysis, whether a particular taking was for public use was a matter for judicial determination. Another revealing case, I've already made reference to this, decided by the Supreme Court of New Jersey, uh, upended an effort by a town to condemn 63 acres of vacant wetlands as an area in need of redevelopment pursuant to a statute which authorized the taking of blighted areas. This is deliciously ironic, of course, because the effort by the community to take wetlands, undeveloped wetlands, seemed to run directly counter to interest in environmental uh, regulation to protect wetlands. The town was basically seeking to label conservation land as blighted because it wasn't being used for its full economic potential. You sort of have the impression someone should call the office and see whether we're doing economic development or, e or environmental protection this day. Um, but in any event, the Supreme Court of New Jersey uh, struck that down, I think of further evidence at least of some judicial skepticism at the state level. So, where does this record leave us? Several points warrant emphasis. One, certainly much of the legislative and judicial response to Kelo has stopped short of categorically barring eminent development takings. Most of the po post Kelo legislation is flawed, but I think it is important not to abandon the drive for legislative relief Experience in some jurisdictions shows it can be done. It's too early to abandon hope for meaningful legislative action, and in some jurisdictions, follow-up legislation has in fact significantly improved the immediate post-Kilo response. Second, constitutional challenges to eminent domain are most likely to find success in state courts, where judges are free to invoke state constitutional law. This inevitably means there will be a wide disparity among the states with respect to the protection afforded individuals from eminent domain abuse. Third, it is important to keep in mind the reality of the situation on the ground. The most significant impact of Kelo may well be heightened public awareness of the need to guard property rights. Additional study is surely needed, but the public outcry may have manifested itself in the abandonment of projects that were going to rely on eminent domain and in larger jury awards in condemnation cases. Judge Learned Hand warned a generation ago about undue reliance on lawmakers and judges to preserve our rights. I think we should perhaps take his, his warning uh, to heart. A welcome, if unintended, consequence of Kelo has been to restore the rights of property owners to public dialogue. This may well, in the long run, yield salutary results. For my money, I think the reform glass is half full, and there is potential to inch upwards. Thank you. Um, and last but uh, not least, of course, uh, Daniel Kelly, Owen Fellow at Yale Law School. As has been mentioned, the reaction to the Kelo decision has been not only unprecedented, 
but also multifaceted. Uh, in addition to over 80% of the states passing legislation in response to the case, you've also had such reactions as BB&T, the financial holdings company, which is one of the uh, 10 largest in the country, uh, saying that they will not finance any projects that use eminent domain. And you even had the case of a group trying to take Justice Souter's residence in New Hampshire on the basis that it would be better used as a lost liberty hotel than its current use. What has been, uh, everybody has basically agreed though that the majority opinion in Kilo was the one because they said that economic development takings do constitute a public use, that that's been less protective of property and that the dissenters generally were more protective of property. What I want to examine today is actually a situation in which it might be argued that the majority actually was more protective of property rights, specifically pretextual takings. So what did the court say about pretextual takings? Justice Stevens said, nor would the city be allowed to take property under the mere pretext of a public purpose when its actual purpose was to bestow a private benefit. In the case though, obviously there were some allegations that a pretext was occurring. Not only did you have Pfizer, a private party, who would benefit very much from the project, you also had the developer, Corker and Jenison, who could receive a benefit. Despite this fact, Justice Stevens and the majority said, no, here there is no pretextual taking. And they pointed to a couple different reasons. One, the fact that there would be a carefully uh, considered development plan, and two, they argued that the private parties were not identifiable at the time of the taking. Justice Kennedy, in concurrence, also picked up on this theme of pretext, argued that if the taking was in fact pretextual, that that would be unconstitutional. And he noted that there may in fact be transfers in which the risk of undetected uh, impermissible favoritism is so acute that a presumption of invalidity is warranted. By contrast, and the reason why I say that the majority, because th they uh, endorse this pretextual uh, takings doctrine, is more protective, the dissent, Justice O'Connor, writing for all four dissenters, noted that if it is true that incidental public benefits from new private use are enough to ensure that the public purpose in a taking, why should it matter, as far as the Fifth Amendment is concerned, what inspired the taking in the first place? So basically what I want to set out to do is talk a little bit about the background of pretextual takings pre-Kilo, talk about how pretextual takings fit in post-Kilo, then identify the problem a little bit more explicitly, offer a proposal and an application. So first, if we look at what happened before Kilo in terms of pretextual takings, although the majority came up with this doctrine, they actually didn't cite any prior cases uh, when they, in that sentence that I referred to earlier in terms of pretext. The only reference I found in any prior Supreme Court decision was an 1848 case, and in that case they quoted Kent's commentary which talked about using eminent domain as a pretext. But in fact, that was just the lawyer making an argument before the Supreme Court, and that lawyer was on the losing end of things. So basically, in the federal constitutional tradition, there's no, tr uh, no, no uh, tradition of pretextual takings. Among the states before Kilo, there was only one statute that mentioned pretext, and that was Georgia. And then there were a handful of cases, one of which Professor Eagle has already mentioned, the 99 cents only stores case, where Costco was, would have been able to expand onto an empty parcel, but instead demanded that the city condemn another adjacent parcel owned by 99 cents only. The court struck down that taking and said that uh, a taking that was demonstrably pretextual uh, would be unconstitution, unconstitutional. Uh, another case uh, is the Sweda case, the Southwest Illinois Development Authority case, in which a racetrack basically demanded that uh, Sweda take land for a parking lot. And there, the court also struck down the taking, saying, and they pointed to a couple different factors. One, that uh, the Southwest uh, Illinois Development Authority didn't conduct any study in terms of the parking lot or the economic plan and also that basically Sweda had said any private co uh, company that comes to us will be willing to take somebody else's land uh, for, an, for a, a private use. That was part of their sort of uh, slogan. Uh, po in, in the post-Kilo realm, there's only two states that have addressed this issue of pretext in any way, 
Those are Texas and Idaho. Uh, and basically what they uh, said was just reiterating what the, the, the Supreme Court said, that a pretextual taking uh, would be invalid. Uh, there are, have been some procedural reforms, like the state of Minnesota, and uh, we could see these as an attempt to smoke out pretext because some of these procedural reforms uh, require, uh, for example, in the case of Minnesota, a public hearing or resolution uh, demanding that the condemning party uh, list the costs and benefits, what are the uh, future uses. So in that way, making the state articulate more what the reasons are for the taking uh, could actually lead to an increase in uh, being able to smoke out protectual takings. Uh, but what has happened in post Kilo, uh, not unsurprisingly, is that litigants have really picked up on the language of Justice Stevens and the concurring opinion by Justice Kennedy and are trying to use this idea of pretext to argue that takings are unconstitutional in the public use clause. Uh, a couple of quick examples, Didden versus the Village of Port Chester, a case that has uh, been referred to already by the panel. Uh, basically, uh, the, la the, one of the, the preferred developer went to the current owner who wanted to use a CVS, the preferred developer wanted a Walgreens in, and basically said, pay me $800,000 or give me a 50-50 stake in the project. Otherwise, I'm gonna go to the condemning authority of the village of Port Chester and take your land. The landowner refused. Two days later, the, uh, the, the condemner condemned the property, and the, uh, although this case went to the Second Circuit, the Second Circuit said, this is fine in a summary order because there was a statute of limitations issue, but they said even if there wasn't time barred under Kilo, uh, we can't review this because it's part of a redevelopment district and an economic development plan. Another case, uh, more recently, the Franco case uh, that was the DC High Court uh, basically said that this was at the uh, motion to dismiss stage. They actually remanded the case. Uh, here you had a, a discount mart which was labeled as a blighting factor. And what happened was the court held that despite the fact that there was actually a development plan, the pretext offense is not foreclosed by Kilo. So in a way, this could be seen as uh, differing from Didden, in which the, the court placed emphasis on the development plan. What the Franco court said, the inquiry though should be, they pointed to that we should look to the benefits the public hopes to realize, and that we should not necessarily think about the motives or intentions of the individual legislatures. Um, and they basically said if the benefits are incidental, then pretext defense may, may succeed. If the benefits are overwhelming uh, for the public, then the pretext defense is unlikely to succeed. So this raises a couple of questions. First of all, are pretextual takings problematic at all? Second, if, if they are problematic, is there a legal framework that we can come up with to analyze allegations of pretext? And finally, within such a framework, what are some pop possible factors that we might consider in determining whether takings are pretextual? There's actually a relatively strong case uh, for the dissent's position that we should not worry about pretextual takings uh, because what that will do is it'll force us to consider motivations. What's the motivation for the taking? Uh, three possible reasons uh, that John Hardelli talked about in his 1970 article in the Yale Law Journal, disutility, futility, and ascertainability. Basically what he means by disutility is, well, although the motivations might not have been exactly pure, the government action actually could produce a net positive benefit. And so if we worry about pretext, then you're gonna eliminate certain actions that are welfare enhancing. Futility basically means, well, isn't this whole doctrine gonna be futile? Because if you, ha if you look at motivations, then the legislature will just, instead of saying the reasons for doing it, just hide the reasons, go back, repass whatever government action they want to do, and basically you'll end up with the same result. And perhaps most importantly, ascertainability. Basically, it's very difficult uh, to determine what reasons are actually uh, given for a government action, including takings. Some people might have mixed motives. It could be partially private, partially public, and it's difficult to come up with a solution for how are, you, how, how are you gonna smoke out these types of takings. I wanna suggest that there are actually some reasons why we might be, wanna be concerned with pretext. On the welfare consideration side, uh, the idea of pretext will lead to undesirable assemblies. It'll also lead to rent seeking. Obviously, this ability to use eminent domain 
is a very powerful tool and what private parties will use a lot of resources which are a social waste to try to uh, uh, acquire this. Also there's legit legitimacy concerns. Uh, there's a concern about c corruption. There's a concern of loss of democratic accountability. The administratib administratability issues, um, although they are difficult, there are certain circumstances in the law in which we look at pretext. For example, Batson challenges. Also, uh, in the free exercise decision of Lukume Babalu IA, um, the court was willing to look at pretext. In one instance in which pretext, the court has said, we're not going to go down that road, the Wren decision for pretextual stops, the court was actually explicit in noting that although the prior pretext cases, we said, we're not going to look at pretext, um, the reason we're doing that is not only or principally because of the difficulty of establishing sub subjective intent. intent. So here's a proposal for potentially dealing with pretext. In other areas of the law, we see that in Title VII, there's actually already a framework established. So you see in the Title VII burden shifting under McDonnell Douglas, and I'll just skip ahead for the purpose of time, we can apply this test, um, which basically shifts the burden, and in step two, puts the burden on the government to come forth with a legitimate uh, reason for why it's not pretextual. So applying this to the condemnation context, we could have a three-step text where in step one, the condemnee must somehow show uh, evidence of favoritism or make a prima facie case for indirect favoritism by showing the involve involvement of a private party, that the private party will obtain a benefit, and that the private party could have a rule, essentially a shelter rule, in which if the government uh, selected somebody ex post through a random or competitive process, it clearly wouldn't be pretextual. Step two, the burden would shift to the government. And the government would have to come forth with some legitimate, neutral reason for the taking. Step three is really where all the action would be. Step three would be where the condemnor has already met the burden of step two, and the burden shifts back to the condemnee, who must show that the condemnor's proffered reason for the taking is protectual. But that raises the question of what is a pretext. And here are some factors that we could consider. If there's no carefully considered development plan, that could be a factor. If there's a particular class of identifiable individuals, that also could be a factor. Uh, we could also look at the ratio of public benefit to private gain. And just very briefly, because I know my time is running out, if we apply this to a recent case that's currently pending before the Second Circuit, Goldstein versus Pataki, we see how this could possibly work. What I want to suggest is that is there would be a step three case, because there is, under step one, a definite private party, uh, the Ratner Development Firm, who would be receiving a benefit. But there are also neutral reasons that the government can give for why this taking uh, is legitimate. So under step three, the court might consider, and these are arguments that have been made in the brief, that the development plan here was actually suggested by the private party. And this was before there was any reason for uh, the land assembly to occur. Not only was the private party the one who came up with the development plan, no other development plans were considered, and the individuals who would benefit from this were identifiable. Here, however, there's an asserted huge public benefit, uh, not only blight, but the, the project, project is basically massive and the uh, city is asserting a huge public benefit. And so what I think will likely happen will, is that the court will just look to this asserted public benefit because under Kelo, you're not, the court said, you're not really allowed to say, well, are we reasonably certain that these benefits will actually occur? And because of that public benefit, I don't expect the Second Circuit to strike the case down. Um, however, I think it's a mistake to only look at the expected benefit to, uh, versus the private gain uh, and not look at other factors that may affect pretext. So in conclusion, I think it's socially desirable that we may want to look at pretextual takings. I think it's possible we can use the framework from Title VII, and I think it's constitutionally necessary because if we don't, what it's going to lead to is courts making ad hoc det determinations and basically imposing their preferences. And so instead of having a jurisprudence of pretext, you would have uh, uh, a jurisprudence that is itself pretextual. Thank you. Uh, okay. Well. I think we have a good deal of time to open the floor for questions, uh, and I think that's uh, probably the best way to proceed at this point. Uh, is the way that this works that I call on people, or? Okay, uh, so uh, yes, go ahead, please. Rob, Rob Nadelson, University of Montana. There's a, in constitutional laws, you probably know, a long history of examining uh, legislative pretexts 
whenever you're in heightened scrutiny. Mm -hmm. um, my, my question has to do with uh, the pretextual comments by Justice Stevens and the concurrence by Justice Kennedy. It looks to me like the standard that Justice Kennedy is looking to uh, impose, and perhaps Justice Stevens as well, uh, is pretty much the same standard that Justice Kennedy enumerated in Rome, the two homosexual rights cases, Romer versus Evans and Lawrence versus Texas, which in turn looks an awful lot like the standard used in Lochner uh, or in the Lochner era, which is a kind of a heightened rational basis scrutiny. There has to be a, a real and substantial connection between means and ends, and there can't be a pretext, meaning that the true end, not some hypothesized end, has to be legitimate and not merely, merely special interest legislation. Um, any thoughts from, um, my question is mostly directed to Steve Eagle, but anyone who wants to take it can do so. Uh, any, any questions as to, is there any, are you have any thoughts about whether that is correct? And if there is anything in, in it, uh, is there material from the Lochner era jurisprudence that can be used by property owners in the future uh, arguing in defense of their rights? Um, yes, I think that uh, Lochner may be uh, quite germane here. I should also add, before I answer the question in, in relation to uh, Jim Ely's comment about the fact that the public use clause has been left to the legislative process rather than your judicial process, I think that's true. But I think the reason why it's true is precisely because the Supreme Court understands that to subject the public use clause to independent, meaningful judicial scrutiny is precisely to retreat from the, uh, the footnote four distinction between economic and social legislation and other kinds of legislation. That's why they're doing it, and I think it applies here. Uh, I think Justice O'Connor had it right on the scrutiny, on the pretext issue. There's no, uh, and I, I think that uh, Dan Kelly's proposal, from what I've briefly seen of it, is a good one in that it would introduce a kind of NEPA or a kind of EIS kind of scrutiny into uh, what's happening, although I think to a certain extent that would increase the, the corporatist nature of uh, redevelopment because now you'd simply up the scale and you'd have to have larger, more cumbersome plans which were ultimately less efficient, although I don't think the result would be any different. But my bottom line on pretext is I think that from whatever we know about 99 cent stores, to use an example, there was ultimately the city acted on behalf of having more redevelopment in the city rather than less. They thought that Costco was a better partner, so 99 cent stores had to go. It may well be that the kind of means and scrutiny under Lochner would be relevant in looking at that, but I don't think the court's going to go there. And I think that this whole question, as long as there's a substantial public benefit, the fact that there is also in a private benefit it does not disqualify you, and, and uh, unless you were to go back to a Lochnerian standard, I don't think it's going to be much of a, of a substantive issue in the long run, even though we could have lots of procedural hoops. Could I, could I could you speak to that as well? Uh, yeah, it went through my mind as we were having this conversation that there was, in fact, a long history of looking at uh, whether economic legislation was protectural. A lot of it came up under the Due Process Clause, uh, and Lochner would be one example, although by no means the only. Both state and federal courts in the late 19th and early 20th centuries examined any number of statutes to see whether they, in fact, uh, were advancing their announced objective. Uh, I think, as Steve has already pointed out, to my mind, the, the real issue, however, is, is the footnote four in Caroline Products, because that is what has effectively denigrated economic rights to a lower kind of constitutional limbo gets a little better than lip service. That's the real problem. We haven't abandoned it. They, goodness knows they use uh, what's, I think, somewhat inaccurately called substantive due process in other areas of law. We just don't use it in the economic area. Uh, I do think that there would be some lessons from the uh, earlier era that would be relevant if, in fact, uh, we began to examine into the pretext issue very closely. One further comment. The problem I've got with the whole pretextual thing is that it strikes me uh, that is going to be very difficult under the Kelo majority's reasoning to, to ever examine into pretext in a meaningful way. 
Justice Stevens made it very clear the court wasn't going to inquire, for example, into the efficacy of these plans, whether they were realistically going to obtain any objective, uh, and that, I think, would certainly be relevant. Uh, and look at even the facts of Kelo itself. Um, Dan talked about a comprehensive plan. Was there a comprehensive plan in Kelo? I mean, there were, obviously, the footprints of Pfizer are all over the deal. Uh, there were bizarre exceptions, to which I think Steve's already alluded. It looked like they were more for local political convenience than anything you could call a plan. And to my knowledge, to this day, this plan is just flat as a pancake. I mean, is there a plan in Kelo? Or is the court just hypothesizing a plan? Just a very quick comment on the, on the footnote four issue. Yeah. The big difference here is that uh, footnote four has not prevented the Supreme Court from applying a moderately elevated standard of review in contracts clause cases, for example, because the contracts clause is a specific constitutional provision um, and it's more defensible than a due proce process area. Similarly, Fifth Amendment takings clause, specific constitutional provision. So a court doesn't have to abandon footnote four in order to apply elevated scrutiny in, uh, uh, in cases like takings no, and contracts. No, I would agree with you totally, uh, except that I do think if you look at the big judicial picture, footnote four, I think, is the ultimate problem. I think that's informed judicial reasoning. Incidentally, um, as someone who's been working on the contract clause a bit, I was unaware the Supreme Court had hardly had any cases in 25 years on the subject, but um, just let that go. Yeah. Just, yeah. just uh, one extremely small comment on the subject. Uh, 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 the Didden versus Village of Port Chester case has already been alluded to as a, uh, an important post-Kilo pretext case. Uh, Richard Epstein and I, uh, Richard also is part of his symposium and not the panel, we uh, wrote a, a, a short piece about this in a national law journal earlier this year. Uh, I think the crucial question here is on the one hand, as Dan mentioned, the Kilo case says that pretextual takings are still forbidden, but on the other hand, it says that if a taking is part of a redevelopment plan, which virtually all takings, by the way, are, at least all economic development and blight takings, then that kind of taking is virtually immunized from challenge. So the difficult question is, how can these two things be reconciled? But on the one hand, there is a very high level of deference to the planning process, even like in the Kilo case itself, where the plan uh, was probably extremely poorly put together. But on the other hand, there is this assurance that pretextual takings are forbidden. So the difficult question is, uh, how are these two things to, to be reconciled? Uh, and you know, Richard and I talked about this a little bit in the National Law Journal piece, but of course the, we haven't exhausted the question by, by any means. Uh, so as that said, we'll uh, move on to other questions. I saw a couple of hands up. Uh, I'm not sure who is first, so I guess I'll uh, first call on the, uh, the gentleman in the back. indicates that in the states, substantive due, economic substantive due process is, as uh, they say at certain law schools, the majority rule. Mm -hmm. uh, and that includes some industrial states like the one uh, that I teach in Pennsylvania. And we've had a very recent case in 2003 where the Pennsylvania Supreme Court struck down a zoning scheme on the grounds that it, it infringed the property rights that are infringed, uh, that, are, uh, that are entrenched in Article I, Section 2 of, uh, of our Constitution, uh, a provision which, of course, has no parallel in the federal document. Hmm. Okay. I have to look, I have to look that one. Uh, I guess I'll call in the next question. Uh, uh, Michelle, I think, or no, I'm sorry, the, the person behind you, Michelle, I think, who's next. Mike Lewin, Florida Coastal School of Law. Uh, this is for, for Professor Kelly. How close is your pretext test to Justice Kennedy's concurrence, which seemed to address some of the same issues, at least to me. That's a good question, Mike. Um, basically, my concern is that although the majority and Justice Kennedy uh, highlighted the fact that we should have this pretext test, um, it's not clear to me what the contours of that test may be. And so what I think, if we are in this uh, post kilo world in which pretext is going to be important, I think it's important to develop uh, standards for what it should be. Now, as Ilya said, one of the things they did refer to is this idea of having a comprehensive development plan. Um, well, I think that's interesting. I don't think that's sufficient because you could have certain takings in which you do have a development plan, 
um, like in the, Di the Didden case. Um, but what does that mean? Does that mean that there's a constitutional free zone that anything goes then uh, as long as you have a plan? Uh, on the other hand, um, there could be circumstances in which you don't have a plan, but there's clearly a public use and it's not a pretext. So I don't think you can rely uh, only on something like sort of this extensive planning that was referred to both by Justice Stevens and Justice Kennedy uh, to take care of the issue. Um, but I think it's generally important that we do develop some standards uh, in a post kilo world. And this could be legislatures or courts under my proposal, uh, but to define what a pretextual taking is so that we don't end up with the courts just saying, well, this looks to us like pretext uh, because most of, most of the pre-Kilo cases um, in which they did find pretext were kind of one-to-one -one transfers, like the 99 cents only case or the Sweda case or the Aaron versus Target Corporation case. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if there are any examples in which the court you know, took a huge assembly and said this is clearly pretextual. So I think that'll be one of the concerns going forward is how are you gonna determine what's a pretextual taking for a massive land assembly like the one in uh, Brooklyn. Yeah, a uh, brief comment on this and also on, on Rob Nagelson's uh, question about uh, footnote four. It seems to me one way to proceed here is to try to get a some, some kind of a residential property covert heightened scrutiny kind of standard that was used, for instance, by the Supreme Court in Cleburne Living Center involving group homes or the Zobel case involving Alaska taxes. Uh, so it, you could have, in fact, a, relax, a, a, a heightened scrutiny standard for residential uh, premises. That, that might work, and that would go a long way towards uh, dealing with the pretext problem. Uh, I think uh, Michelle would be next. Thanks. I'm uh, Michelle Boardman from George Mason. If we could ask a question um, for a moment about the just compensation end as opposed to the public use end, um, and I guess this is for Professor Dana. Uh, your discussion of um, what happens to trailer park residents made me start to think about whether or not we should conceive of just compensation to include things like replacement cost. Right? I mean, it's not subjective value. You could actually figure out what the economic value of attempting to purchase similar property of course, it'd be difficult to figure out exactly what the appropriate geographical area is. Um, and I don't mean that as a, as a constitutional question, right? So assuming for the moment something I don't know but assume, which is that just compensation has an inherent meaning along the lines of market value, but maybe we could have a state statutory commitment to conceive of just compensation in a more broad sense. What are your thoughts on the economic or feasibility of that? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I should say, by the way, subjective value uh, is a little bit of a misnomer because what I mean there is non-fair market value, so it in includes things like replacement cost. Um, well, I should say there is a little bit of statutory law on the books on this. The question, one question is how effective it is and what it really does. There's a Federal Uniform Relocation, Uniform Relocation okay. Act, and there are also state versions of it, um, which seem to purport to offer in certain categories of cases where state or federal agencies are kind of undertaking the condemnation, um, a guarantee of a comparable new dwelling. Uh, and there's a lot of question about whether really um, there's no private right of action under those. It's really, there's almost no empirical data about what's really done. I think they're wildly under-inclusive. It's very unclear. But that could be a model for something like, like that. And, and, and it might be that actually doing a statutory approach to that would get at some of the concerns that I'm trying to get to in a less, you know, <laughs> kind of theoretical or abstract way. Um, but that raises real questions of political economy. Um, uh, because uh, if the groups protected would largely be tenants or low-income tenants, would you see any kind of legislation, you know, along those lines? I mean, you know, in a way, it's amazing that there's legislation at all post kilo because if you looked at kind of standard political economy, public choice thinking, you really wouldn't think there'd be much at all, and there hasn't been a lot of legislative ferment um, on the compensation issue. The only thing I'm aware of is in some states, but Ilya may know this better. There have been proposals for higher compensation for residences when those are taken. Um, and that doesn't really translate into being able to get a replacement, necessarily. And I don't know if any of those were in action. Um, well, I, I, I'll let you finish and I'll count. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> uh, okay, well, I'm, not, I, I'm not aware of anything that's been acted post kilo on this. There is an article by Nicole Garnett last year in the Michigan Law Review where she discusses much a, a great deal of prior state and federal legislation, which in some cases 
does give people more compensation and fair market value. Uh, but to make a long story short, uh, I would say two things about it. One is I'm skeptical that in many cases it really does fully compensate even for relocation and replacement costs. And indeed, there's a lot of surveys of people displaced in uh, urban renewal and blight takings and the like, which suggest that overall, even after being compensated, uh, they were worse off than before. Uh, so uh, while, there's, while it's a little bit more than what the federal courts require, it's m still maybe less than full compensation. And second, uh, to some extent, second what uh, uh, David said, which is that uh, to the extent that these are relatively politically weak people who are being displaced, in many cases also poor people, it's unlikely that states would enact legislation to, in effect, redistribute money from politically more powerful and wealthier people to give it to these uh, poorer people. Uh, now, David also says, well, why would then legislation be passed at all? That's a, a question that obviously Jim is uh, ad addressing in his article and I've addressed in a paper of mine. What I say in my paper is a lot of the strong legislation has been enacted, has actually been enacted in states which, uh, which rarely, if ever, engage in these kinds of economic development takings to begin with. So for instance, the state of South Dakota has a very strong law which they enact, and I commend them for it, I do, it's a good law, but how many economic development takings did they have in the last five or seven years? Zero, right? So uh, certainly you can enact strong legislation if uh, what you're restricting is things that you haven't really been doing anyway. Uh, there are a few states like Florida and others which did enact strong legislation even though they had been doing a lot of these things. I'm certainly not suggesting it's all a sham, uh, but I think that uh, if you look at the states who enacted strong legislation, the majority of them are these ones that rarely did these things to begin with and only a relatively small number of states have enacted strong legislation, particularly in the area of blight and protecting the poor, uh, where they really did uh, do a lot of these sorts of activity to begin with. Uh, so I think I've uh, abused my moderator's privilege enough, and uh, I'll uh, be quiet and let uh, Jim speak. Uh, just wanted to pursue this just compensation for a moment. There is, of course, a vast literature that just compensation as presently determined falls far short of putting people back in the position that they would be. It falls far short of Blackstone's idea of an exact equivalent. Be that as it may, uh, and while I think a good argument could be made that we should give higher than market value to persons whose property is taken across the board, across the board, to compensate for uh, subjective values, relocation costs, loss of neighborhood identity, et cetera, uh, While well, I think a good case can be made across the board, I'm very skeptical about the literature, which seems to suggest that if we get heightened compensation, that would somehow adjust for any kind of uh, review under the public use clause. I don't believe at the end of the day that that will be as protective of the rights of owners as uh, the proponents uh, uh, contend. And I argued the same thing in an article of mine, but uh, I'll, I'll move on to the next uh, <laughs> yes, um, we'll uh, uh, question. Um, uh, yes, and you've been waiting for uh, for a while. Please go ahead. Uh, I'm uh, not Yetzel. I'm, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Can you wait for the microphone? Mm -mm. I'm Nadia Nedzel. I'm from uh, Louisiana, and I actually have two questions that I think are are a um, are joint are joint. Um, they both relate to a tremendous skepticism I've developed over the last couple of years about the efficacy of government in general, uh, having been through Katrina. And the first is, uh, when it comes to economic takings, has there been any systematic study that these plans are typically effective or more effective than a simple market remedy? I'm thinking of Berman, which was a failure to begin with, followed by Poll Town. There have been other anecdotal instances where a public taking related to some sort of plan flopped. Um, in comparison to something like, I think, downtown Chicago, which was a market redevelopment of the loop area. Um, so that's one question. So before we even get to pretext, uh, I wonder if there's any fundamental justification for an economic taking um, that has any likelihood of success long term. Uh, since I'm a non-planner, I guess that puts me in the non-planner category for New Orleans. The other issue that we have I in New Orleans is that post-Katrina, there are some horrific problems. Um, we have such a morass of succession issues 
that knowing who owned, who actually owned a specific property that is now more than blighted is next to impossible. Consequently, I think that lately the, the, the worst case scenario has been the, the, the outpouring of, of uh, former uh, public housing components who want the St. Bernard housing projects to be re redeveloped, rebuilt, and those were horrible. They were a terrible place to live, and what the city council was trying to do was to actually distribute, uh, like I said, a, a, a one to 10 ratio of subsidized housing among new developments. So if uh, perhaps professors Eli and Kelly could address the first part of the question relating to um, any studies with regard to economic takings, and perhaps Professor Dana with regard to the poverty issue. Thank you. Well, I'll let you go first, Dan. Uh, I think it's an excellent question, because uh, oftentimes uh, these policies are put in place, and there's not a lot of uh, empirical data about what's exactly going on. Um, to my knowledge, there, there are no sort of any economists who have done empirical studies uh, to validate the fact that you know, eminent domain overall achieves way better market outcomes, or way better outcomes than the market does. Uh, sort of the theoretical justification that's posited in the literature uh, is because of the holdout problem. So the idea that if somebody needs to assemble, say, 10 parcels, um, if you didn't have some way to uh, assemble those, that the existing owners could behave str strategically and uh, you know, knowing that the owner needs all of those parcels would inflate the value of what they're asking for more than they actually value. Um, I think you're correct to point out uh, that there's you know, anecdotal evidence that sometimes these projects uh, don't work out. Uh, there are uh, examples that could be given on the other side. Uh, I think Baltimore um, used eminent domain to revitalize their, their city center, um, but I'm not aware of any you know, comprehensive uh, studies that have looked at this across the board. Yeah, that m really more or less tracks my own impression. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an economist by background. Uh, certainly our moderator and others have pointed out that uh, the famous or infamous Polton case never produced the jobs that General Motors promised, never produced the tax revenue that was bandied about, uh, in fact fell far short of expectation. Uh, I, I have a sense that may have been true with some other grandiose projects as well. Of course, that doesn't mean that private projects might not also fail. I don't know about your community, but uh, Nashville, my adopted home, has a number of white elephant malls that never seem to quite take off uh, and are now basically uh, quasi shut. Uh, but in any event, um, uh, my sense is that it's a very mixed bag. Uh, the Baltimore example is an interesting one because uh, I've actually talked to people a bit about the, the Baltimore harbors, but I think they, they revitalized. Uh, my sense is they were able to acquire actually a lot of the parcels from the voluntary, the voluntary market, uh, but that they did in fact have to resort to at least a threat of eminent domain to acquire some, some, some holdout situations. So I think it was partly market driven, partly uh, a hefty use of, of coercive power to achieve that result. Uh, uh, how it's worked across the board in other communities, I just can't say. Perhaps someone in the audience would have experiences they could share. If I could just add briefly, too, uh, a couple other examples where market forces have worked. Uh, Harvard University actually acquired um, a bunch of land uh, through um, secret agents, so essentially through, you know, without using eminent domain, and Disney World did the same thing. And another interesting aspect of your question is actually uh, within the pretext, the idea of the pretextual takings, you kind of have a dilemma because on the one hand, if you have um, no private involvement in the plan taking, um, you might just have a government going out saying, oh, well, we think that an assembly would look good here. They might not have as good of information as private parties. The government party, so if you adopt a policy of uh, a strict no pretext policy, the government then might grab a bunch of land and say auction it off to the highest bidder, but who knows whether those they value the property uh, more than the existing owners. On the other hand, if you have private parties coming in early, say with an idea, we have a great development that we think an assembly that would work, then you have this problem of, well, the private parties are just trying to rent seek and use eminent domain to benefit themselves. So it's kind of a, a double-edged sword. Um, yeah, I should say I, I in a, have a piece coming out of Vermont where I tried to look, part of it is an economic analysis, look at the literature about redevelopment plans. And, 
One, we don't even know exactly how often eminent domain is used. I mean, there's really, you know, it's remarkably fragmented. It's not necessarily centralized. Um, you know, they're tr planning kind of NGOs and sort of the Institute for Justice have different alt collections of examples with different stories about what happens, but it does you know, there's no kind of systematic way to look at it. Um, and the other issue uh, you kind of mentioned downtown Chicago is even when eminent domain isn't used, a pure market isn't really the alternative because, for example, in, in Chicago, tax increment fin financing has been used sort of incredibly um, lavishly uh, uh, in redevelopment, so there are other kinds of subsidies at work. Um, I should say in, in New Orleans, just kind of, I think it's a very interesting story about redevelopment in New Orleans and what, um, is, what is being proposed, you know, this kind of mixed-use redevelopment is very much consistent with the trend both in federal HUD policy, uh, an effort um, within the planning community to the extent there's a consensus, and a lot of state redevelopment agencies. So, uh, and there is at least some empirical evidence that it tends to correlate uh, with better outcomes for families. Um, uh, New Orleans, though, is so, as you know, so sui generis <laughs> um, because you have such an impoverished city. It, it, all of the developments are within the same city. It's less, it's less clear how it's going to work. Um, but it seems to me that what the city's proposing in terms of spreading out uh, what was otherwise a large concentrated housing project is very much consistent with what is being thought of elsewhere. I don't know. Okay, so yeah. yeah. Uh, just two very quick comments on the general issue of the effectiveness uh, of this. I agree with everyone else, obviously, that we don't have a systematic study, but I think there is uh, considerable evidence and also theoretical consideration would suggest that at least a large proportion of the time it's unlikely that so-called economic development takings would be better in the market. Uh, Dan has already alluded to uh, his article about secret purchases, which suggested in situations where there are holdout problems. The private sector often can handle them through secret purchases without resorting to eminent domain, and I certainly commend this article to you on that. In my own work, I've looked at the other end of the dilemma, which is to ask, well, even if we assume theoretically that there can be situations where eminent domain is uh, more effective in the market, are there reasons to believe the government will actually confine the use of these takings to those situations as opposed to simply using them to take property from politically weak people to give it to politically powerful people. And I suggest for a variety of reasons in my article is that the latter scenario is more likely, even if Dan is wrong and, in fact, there is an, in economic theory a set of situations where eminent domain really would be the, uh, the best option. It's unlikely that real world governments would, would read these economic theory articles and base their policies on that as opposed to uh, the realities of who's politically powerful and who isn't. Uh, lastly, just on Louisiana, Louisiana, at least in my judgment, is one of the states that has passed a pretty strong post-QL eminent domain reform law, including by referendum. So I doubt that, uh, at least if Louisiana courts enforce this law, I doubt that uh, um, there will soon be huge QL-style takings or whatnot, because such takings are now uh, illegal. Uh, I do think that there will be sort of interesting takings and other property law issues at stake in New Orleans. Uh, in particular, uh, as I understand it, under New Louisiana law, it's still possible to condemn abandoned property, and there is a lot of property in, Louisiana, in, in the area of uh, New Orleans which either actually is abandoned or at least the local government can argue that it is, and the disposition of that property will uh, raise, I think, some uh, interesting uh, planning issues and uh, property law issues and the like, uh, but it does seem to me that given the situation where so much had been destroyed and abandoned, probably I don't think you need eminent domain, for the most part at least, to uh, uh, to rebuild the city. Rather, what you need is a generally uh, good economic climate, which will encourage people to invest and to uh, you know, make progress. Uh, Ilya, on the New Orleans uh, point, uh, first, uh, on, February, on the afternoon of February 8th, uh, I and some lawyers in New Orleans are doing a panel on post-Katrina condemnation issues at the Sinesta Hotel in the French Quarter uh, on the afternoon of uh, February 8th. Uh, 
on uh, more generally. How do we get invited down to New Orleans? That's yeah. a, how, oh, just come. Okay. Yeah, yeah, just, uh, uh, was, that, was, that har- was that a hardship assignment, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, on the question of, uh, uh, of, of uh, secondary rent seeking more generally, one of the issues that came up with just compensation is the feeling of pervasive unfairness that people are losing their homes so that other people can gain the immense value from their land of of packaging it and assembling it and then rededicating it to another use. One of the elements that I'm, I'm doing in my paper is trying to think, uh, is trying to explore ways of giving some of those assembly gains to the homeowners, which would both benefit them in the case of giving them more compensation and also discourage secondary rent seeking. Uh, we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, I think, uh, Lee, you've been waiting for a while to ask your question, so please do. Go ahead. Okay, I'm also going to cheat and uh, say, just for everybody's information, in the uh, talks uh, at 11 o'clock, um, that we've got the rooms wrong for Tom Odom and Moyne Yaya, so people coming to listen to either of them. Uh, Moyne is going to be here, and Tom is going to be in Games Hog, so um, just so that everybody knows that. Um, the other thing, uh, my question is actually uh, for about this pretext business. Um, I wonder how well pretext really can work here because it seems to me that pretext is good at ferreting out a forbidden motivation, but it seems to me you have to have a forbidden motivation to make it work because otherwise people do things for different for, for, for more than one reason. Um, and it, 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 therefore, I, I, I don't know what work pretext can really, really do here since it's pretty likely that there will be an arguable case uh, for the taking, um, uh, being for economic development purposes as well as for whatever, for, for, as well as for whatever the private purpose is. Um, so I wonder if pretext without a forbidden motivation can really be made to work to do anything here. I think it's an excellent question. Um, just a couple uh, brief thoughts. Uh, one, uh, you pointed to the fact that uh, there might be mixed motivations um, and an arguably justified one. I think actually in the, the Title VII literature and other literatures that deal with pretext, the whole idea of mixed motivations actually comes up a lot and a whole doctrine has developed there. Now you're right to point out in those contexts that the, the motivation is something that we uh, uh, you know, consider discriminatory. Um, actually, one of the slides that I, I cut for the sake of time uh, that I had in there was uh, possibly proposing the idea that in addition to looking at favoritism um, for pretext, I, you know, namely favoring private developers, you also might be able to apply this doctrine um, for disfavored parties. So say, for example, um, if eminent domain is used against somebody, uh, let's say a church, um, because the church isn't producing tax dollars, or say it's even a disfavored church, um, that you might be able to apply pretext also in this uh, to disfavored parties. Um, but I think you're right that it is complicated because whenever you look into the idea of motivations, you're going to have mixed motivations, you're going to have plausible arguments, um, as Professor Eagle has said, you know, that these actually are benefiting the local government. Yeah, I've actually made a similar argument to one that you made in a piece I published last year where I said that pretext scrutiny can only have a limited role precisely because uh, there tend to be mixed motives and also because people rarely say to themselves, well, I'm doing this you know, just to screw over the general public for the benefit of General Motors or mm-hmm. Pfizer or you know, what have you. Most people tend to persuade themselves that what's in their political interest also uh, benefits the general public. However, I reserve the right to modify my judgment somewhat after I fully study Dan's interesting proposal. So, uh, <laughs> perha- And obviously, this is something that has been debated in other areas of constitutional law where we do have pretext scrutiny, such as in the race area and the religion area. So uh, I, I wouldn't say that it's completely useless. I would just say that uh, maybe it has limited utility, uh, and maybe Dan's article will show it has greater utility than, than I think. <laughs> trying to figure out 
is somebody doing something for a particular bad reason, and if he's doing it for any par in any part for that particular bad reason, it's going to be bad. Um, whereas here, um, you can't say just because there's some private benefit, uh, there's also a bad reason. That so I think it it it, it may just the, the analysis may just not work, carry over very well. Uh, maybe I guess would we? I I have time to discuss at length, but I think we'll move to another. Uh, uh, the last one or two questions that we have time for. Uh, so maybe two more. Uh, 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 a gentleman in the back over here. Uh, Keith Sharkman from uh, Marquette. I just wanted to follow up on Michelle Boardman's question earlier about the uh, market value standard for compensation. Um, isn't one problem with a market value standard uh, that the government can uh, manipulate the market value by uh, an announcing that, that they're planning to do a taking and talking down the value of the property so that by the time they do the taking, it's, uh, the market value has moved in response uh, to not, not to any inherent market force but, but because of the government's uh, manipulation of the market value or by taking uh, adjacent properties, nearby properties. Uh, uh, those other takings wouldn't be relevant, would they, in the valuation of the particular property uh, in dispute, and yet uh, they, they might have an effect of manipulating the market value uh, 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 downward. And then the last uh, uh, point I would make is, uh, suppose you sell, you know, the government talks down, announces they might be doing a taking or will be do, taking it, uh, and then you sell the property. Does the taking claim run with the land, or how does it work? I mean, do you, do you does the buyer have the taking claim, or does the seller get to make a taking claim even after they've sold the property? I can answer those both really quickly. The first concept is called condemnation blight. It is strictly illegal. The landowner will win. All the landowner has to do is prove it, which is almost impossible. <laughs> on the second, on the on the uh, on the second point again was. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, that was the first one. That's Oh, the takings claim. The takings claim belongs to the the compensation goes to the person who owned the property at the time of the con of the condemnation. And, and even after they sell, they still have the claim. Uh, at the time of the condemnation, if they sell it later, after the formal condemnation, they still get it. At, at the time of the condemnation uh, action is at the time of the actual condemnation is the person who gets the, the proceeds. There is a contrary phenomenon, though. You know, once it's clear that an assembly is going on and there's a project in the works, the, at least arguably fair market values go up. And so um, there may be this counter argument. And fair market value, you know, is incredibly disputed by sophisticated parties in condemnation proceedings. And sometimes they can do very well or do terribly. And so it's really art, not science. Uh, additions in value caused by the project don't count. Do we have time for one more question? No, okay, uh, I'm told that they need the room, so uh, while well, I'd love to continue discussion, I will have to ask you instead to uh, read the pieces when they come out in the Supreme Court Economic Review, uh, hopefully early next year, and there will probably be things posted before then on SSRN. Uh, thank you very much for coming, and thanks to Federal Society for allowing us to hold this. Well, I'm sure it's a comment. It's very nice.